Right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Michael, for uh, leading us uh, in that time of worship. Uh, just a welcome to everyone, to the regular family of Wellspring. And uh, I know since we've been online, we've acquired a few more people from all over the world. And uh, uh, thank you for joining us. It's a very special day in the church calendar. And uh, I trust we're going to have a great time together um, as we as we learn something from God's word today. Um, if I had told you a month ago that we would be celebrating Passover Easter online, uh, you would probably have asked me if my prescription got messed up somewhere along the way. But here we are, uh, indoors and uh, online. And the good news is that last night we were blessed with another two weeks. So uh, let's make the most of what we have in front of us. Um, you may recall on Sunday, the fifth last Sunday, we have um, been walking through the last week of Jesus' life. And, um, and I trust that you've been encouraged by, by what we've shared. But especially if you've taken the opportunity to look through the discussion questions, um, they would really have helped you to, to apply uh, what we have, have looked at. And so we've arrived here on day six, which is uh, Good Friday. So the Gospels um, uh, record primarily the events as they happened. And I'm, so I'm just going to quickly go through just the events so that we have a picture in our minds. Um, but it is it was up to the Apostles to help us understand the details of what was actually taking place. So, so just quickly, if we if we just remind ourselves of what happened on this particular day, we know that um, I left off yesterday where Jesus was uh, betrayed and he was arrested. And we know from there he was taken into custody. Uh, he was mocked. Um, he, he was then taken, remember this happened very early on the Friday morning. Uh, he was taken before Caiaphas, the high priest and the council. Um, and then he was moved between Pilate and Herod and back to Pilate. But at the end of the day, it boiled down to a choice. Did they want Jesus or did they want a criminal, Barabbas? And the crowd chose Barabbas. So by nine o'clock on the Friday morning, um, Jesus was hanging on the cross. By 12 o'clock, the Bible tells us that darkness covered the land. Uh, it was not some astronomical event was really a sign of the wrath of God. Jesus was truly drinking from the cup of his father's wrath and bearing the burden of, of the sin of the world. And by three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus uttered his last words, it is finished, and he gave up his spirit and died. And so by three o'clock in the afternoon, it was all done. But as I said uh, just now, it's the apostles who teach us and explain to us what was actually happening. Um, so I, I'm just going to read one very brief passage from Paul, from Romans 3, which really sums up uh, a very accurate description of what, what happened on the cross. And I'm not going to read it from one of the traditional translations because Paul uses some very big words that we probably don't all understand so well. So I'm going to read from the message version uh, because it really brings us back to the heart of what I would like to share this morning. So I'm reading from the message version and it's Romans chapter three, verse 21 to 26. But in our time, something new has been added. What Moses and the prophets witnessed to all those years has happened. The God setting things right that we read about has become Jesus setting things right for us. And not only for us, but for everyone who believes in him. For there is no difference between us and them in this. Since we've compiled this long and sorry record as sinners and proved that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives uh, that God wills for us, God did it for us out of sheer generosity. He put us in right standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess that we're in 
and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. God sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world to clear the world of sin. Having faith in him sets us in the clear. God decided on this course of action in full view of the public to set the world in the clear with himself through the sacrifice of Jesus. Finally, taking care of the sins he has so patiently endured. This is not only clear, but it's now. This is current history. God sets things right. He also makes it possible for us to live in his rightness. What a wonderful uh, explanation of what was happening on the cross. And one thing is clear. This is a God thing. This is, a, this is not an us thing. This is a God thing. So God did two things. He, first of all, he cleared his name. The, the, the scripture tells us that he patiently endured. He cleared his name and he demonstrated that sin will not go unpunished. Um, it won't be swept under the carpet. It will be dealt with. And he, he, he dealt with it through Jesus on the cross. But the other, at the same time, he offers us um, as sinners the long record of sorry, sorriness that we read about. He offers us a gift, that which we were incapable of doing on our own. He now makes it possible and he gives it to us as a gift. And the only condition is that having faith with him. And then that passage ends off with a statement that God sets things right. And uh, I was really drawn to that statement, God sets things right. So as I was preparing and, and just going, um, going through the, the, the gospel accounts and, and, and what we are taught in the New Testament, uh, thinking about this statement, I actually noticed something that I hadn't noticed before. Uh, and which you would, I want to share with you today, uh, because it rings true with these words that God sets things right. In the past week, um, I have uh, mentioned several times how uh, Jesus lived out and fulfilled uh, the prophetic words that were spoken to him hundreds of years before he came onto the scene, and how those prophetic words um, uh, detailed literally every step of the way everything that Jesus did and what he had accomplished. And uh, for example, uh, what happened today on Good Friday, one needs to go no further than Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, and just see how clearly and how, how detailed the prophet saw in advance what was going to happen. Uh, but something that I did not realize, um, and I read this in Isaiah 53, in verse 9, was that God even took care and reminded us of what would happen at the burial of Jesus. So in Isaiah 53, verse 9, it says this, And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. So this morning, I want to take the opportunity and look at two people who played a role in the burial of Jesus. And unbeknown to them, they were fulfilling prophetic word at this incredible hinge in history. But at the same time, these two people are, uh, are, are an example forever to us of, uh, of a couple of things. And one of the things that, uh, that they will always be a reminder to us of is that it's never too late to step out of the shadows and serve God and to accept God's gift and to allow God to set things right. So I'm speaking about Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And so I'd like you to go with me to, God, to John's Gospel. And if we can go to chapter 19, and we're going to read from verses 38 to 42. John's Gospel. All the Gospels mention the story of Joseph and of Nicodemus, but I'm just going to read the one from John's Gospel. So from verse 19, um, sorry, from verse 38. 
After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had earlier come by Jesus, come to Jesus by night, um, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths and spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. So here's a couple of thoughts. When Jesus died at three o'clock in the afternoon, um, remember their day from, from a Jewish perspective starts at sunset. So their, their Sabbath was about to start as the sun went down that day. So there was only a couple of hours of daylight left. And uh, according to their custom, they, everyone had to be indoors like us uh, and do nothing. Um, so it was going to be a tough ask to, 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 to fulfill all the normal rituals. Um, and the Jews did not want dead people hanging on crosses uh, as they entered into their Sabbath. So they asked Pilate um, to go and check the bodies. And if, they, if anyone was still alive, to break their legs so that they could get them off the crosses. And we see that in actually in John in verse 31, 19, it says, since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. So it was their custom, it was a Roman custom, that if no one claimed the body, they would simply dump the body on the rubbish heap. And they called it the Valley of Gehenna which is actually the rubbish pit of Jerusalem. But God had planned every detail. Even in the Lord's burial, having paid the price for our salvation, Jesus would not be tossed onto the rubbish heap. But according to the prophet, his grave would be that of a rich man. And uh, it, is, it is in this scene and onto this steam, scene that out of the shadows stepped Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. So we know from scripture a couple of things about these people. First of all, they were members of the ruling council, the, the Sanhedrin. Matthew tells us that Joseph was a disciple. In Matthew 27, 57, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus, as we read about it in John. Mark tells us that Joseph was looking for the kingdom of God. Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God. Luke tells us the same thing, that Joseph was a good and righteous man and that he had not consented with the decisions and actions of the council and was himself looking for the kingdom. Nicodemus, we know back in John chapter 3, Three came to Jesus by night. Uh, it says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And we also know that although he struggled to understand, um, he never accused Jesus of being false. So together, these two take upon themselves to care for the burial of the Lord's body. And so what do we see um, in their efforts? What do we see in their actions? Well, first of all, uh, they risked everything. They risked everything to bury Jesus. You must remember these were respected members of the council. They were wealthy. They were well thought of. But Jesus was a convicted criminal, and now they were actually associating themselves with Jesus. 
In fact, if we read in other parts of the Gospels, after Jesus was arrested, even those who followed Jesus, for example, Peter, but there was other people as well, they were already being, being harassed because of their association with Jesus. And to honor Jesus uh, by burying his body, it, would, it was like defecting to the other side. So their position, their security, their wealth would, would all be at risk. But here they were doing an act of loving service. The question is, where were the other disciples? And we know where they were. Jesus told them the day before that they would all be scattered. And so the first thing we realize about these guys is they really, they risked everything. Secondly, this was not glamorous work. Uh, here were two high profile leaders uh, doing actually a very depressing but necessary work, moving the lifeless body of the Son of God. And all they had time to do was to wrap it up in a linen cloth and to put in some spices uh, and wait until after the Sabbath before the rest of the preparations could be done according to their customs. Yet this was a service of love. Even they probably felt they had missed out on so much uh, because they had kind of like remained in the shadows. They probably missed, they probably felt they had, there was so much more that they could have uh, learned. But they made the all important decision to honor Jesus at this time. And thirdly, we can see is that this cost them something. Joseph provided his own tomb, very costly to cut it out of rock, and only wealthy people could afford that. And Nicodemus provided 75 pounds worth of spices, which was a small fortune in itself. So they, they risked everything. It was not glamorous work. It was a, it was a selfless act of, of love. And uh, it, cost them, it cost them dearly. So what can we learn from these two people who, according to the scriptures, followed Jesus? They were disciples. Um, well, we don't know all the reasons. We don't all know all the reasons why they were in the shadows. Um, maybe they were just not sure. Maybe, maybe they were hesitant. Maybe, maybe they saw their roles differently. Maybe they realized that they could serve God in other ways. And this is important because we need disciples, we need followers of Jesus to be in every sphere of society and to be influencers wherever they are. But what we do see is that even in his death, even in the burial of the Lord, God's grace was at work at the, in, the, in the lives of these two people. Here they had an opportunity to make a choice an opportunity to step out of the shadows and to serve the purposes of God. As I was uh, looking up um, around these two folks, I read in the Africa Bible commentary. I like this particular commentary because it, it contextualizes all these examples in terms of examples from Africa and uh, African proverbs and customs. And it's very interesting. So the, the commentator who was writing on this particular passage uh, said this. He said, when Joseph and Nicodemus risked their popularity among their peers and gave as they did, they did not see beyond providing an honorable burial for Jesus. If they were prepared to do so much for a dead Jesus, how much more should we who know him as our risen savior, do for him. Interesting comment. In other words, Joseph and Nicodemus, uh, they did what was honorable, but they probably had no expectation beyond Saturday. Um, and uh, they didn't realize how Sunday would turn out. But I can imagine what a joy for them uh, when he did rise, knowing that they took the opportunity to care for him with that selfless act of love. So I believe the story teaches us a couple of things. Um, 
But I want to leave you with this one statement. And that is this, that true obedience is never wasted. True obedience is never wasted. You see, we are not all out there in the front, breaking new ground, taking the gospel to the nations. We're not all out there. We're not all out there in the, in the limelight. But we all have significant roles to play. And one day at the wedding feast of the Lamb, someone might just come and tap you on the shoulder and say thank you for the impact that you might have had in their lives because of selfless act of love and of service because you love the Lord. So the other thing that I want to leave you with is this. It's never too late to step out of the shadows. It's never too late to serve the Lord, especially today as we remember what, what God has done in Christ for us. Um, and we think of Joseph and of Nicodemus. We need to grab every opportunity that we have to serve the Lord. So as we as we remember that, as we remember that this that God set things right for them, um, as, as we remember that, let's let's come to the table and together as a family, let us remember together what God has set right for us today. So I'm going to go to the Gospel of Luke and I'm going to read from um, Luke 22, verses 14 to 20, as we break bread together and as we take the cup together. So if you can have your, your elements ready, uh, I will read it and then um, I will go through it with you. So this is Luke chapter 22 from verse 14. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. For this, uh, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. And so as we come to the Lord's table with the cup and uh, with the bread, we want to first of all thank the Lord for his body that was broken for us according to the scriptures. And we want to thank the Lord for his blood which was poured out for us and through which we now have the new covenant. And we also want to thank the Lord but because of his grace, his restless grace, that is always seeking out opportunities uh, to reach those who have not had an opportunity to respond and which is so freely available. And so for those of you who are, who are watching, um, if you feel that, that there are things in your life that needs to be set right, uh, maybe it's maybe it's to acknowledge the work of God for the first time. I don't know, but maybe it's it's an opportunity to to be prompted to move out of the shadows and to take up our rightful place as as followers as disciples of Jesus. Just take this opportunity to quietly go before the Lord and speak to Him, speak to Him in, into your uh, uh, in your heart. And so I'm going to pray, and, and uh, after I've prayed, we can take the elements together. So, Father, I want to thank you for the body of our Lord. Thank you that it was broken for us. Thank you for the cup. Thank you that it represents the blood of the new covenant. And thank you, Lord, that these things are so simple, and you've told us to remember them. But as we read this morning, all of this is a God thing, 
and it has set things right for us. So Lord, we are deeply grateful uh, for what you have done. And uh, we take this opportunity to remember you this morning. So let's eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I'm going to close for us in a word of prayer. So Father, we thank you that we can spend this time together as your family. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of the work that you did for us and how you set things right for each and every one of us. Thank you for your grace, Lord, that is always after us. And Lord, as we think of Joseph and as we think of Nicodemus, Lord, we want to ask you, Lord, that you would help us, each one of us, take up our rightful roles, take up our rightful places, Lord, to, to be known as your followers and as your servants. And so, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity for you to teach us, and we bless you for it in Jesus' name. So, guys, we thank you for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Good Friday, and um, we'll be in touch again. Thank you. Amen. Bye.